Good morning, crew. Good morning, everybody. I'm Todd Crenshaw, not Cynthia. Welcome to the Orange Chatham Association of Realtors Property Management Council meeting for November 2021. That's a mouthful. Welcome, everybody. We'll continue to admit people as they log in. We have a nice little group this morning, and I'm glad you're all here. We have a great discussion presentation today from Gene Hobbs from the Real Estate Commission on the top 10 ways we're gonna get in trouble. Um, <laughs> before we do that, I wanna welcome everybody, invite you to turn on your cameras, unmute your mics. Um, this is a great time to let us know if you have any announcements to make, anything you want us to be aware of. Um, and I think, I think today I will dispense with going around and having introductions made. At this point, I feel like we're probably familiar with everyone, but um, make yourselves known and let's get started. All right, you ready for me to share my screen? I have your introduction if you'd like me to make it. You know what? I'm happy to introduce myself. Well, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled to be here. So my name's Jean Hobbs, and I am an auditor investigator with the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. I've been with the commission for 16 years. I started here as an information officer. So one of the individuals that does nothing but answer calls all day long. And then I became a consumer protection officer after um, doing that just for a little while, I knew that I wanted to be a field investigator. So I actually went back to school and got my accounting degree so that I could become an auditor investigator with the Real Estate Commission. But what I wanna let you know is in advance of coming to work with the Real Estate Commission, I've actually um, been in the real estate brokerage business. I've had a license in three different states since around 1993. So um, I've been where you are. So I just want to let you know that. And I love being able to communicate and um, connect with brokers in this way, because normally when I'm coming and knocking on doors, people get very nervous. And I want you to be able to see that I'm not somebody that you need to be nervous about coming to knock on your door. So with that, let me get started. So um, one of the things I want to say is feel free if you have questions as we go along to unmute, um, just say your name so that I know who is speaking to me or um, type in chat. And Todd, if people type in chat, would you let me know? Because I, since I don't have a second screen, I don't always know. I will definitely do so. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. So for today, we are going to be covering um, property management issues that happen prior to the tenancy, during the tenancy, security deposits, which happens at the end of the tenancy. So it's actually in that section. I want you to know that I don't, when I give you case examples, they're not going to be from your area. So don't go looking around the Hollywood squares trying to figure out who I'm talking about because I make sure that none of the cases that I tell you about are in your area, all right? So just be aware of that. So, okay. So property management issues, they come in all of these realms, but we get the complaints from the landlord side and the tenant side. And I just want you to know that we know that you're in a very tricky situation, right? Because you, you have landlords and tenants complaining about you. And as I go along, I try to give you both sides of what we see. So tell me what percentage of complaints do you think we receive involve property management? Anybody? <laughs> Based on what I see on the shame pages, <laughs> maybe 30%. Okay, anybody else? Michelle Hobo says 60%. Okay. She's a pessimist. <laughs> I'd have to agree with her as well because reading the, the back pages there, 
it seems like 60, 70% of it is property management related. People not paying the money out to the owners, things like that. Right. So actually very good guesses. It's actually 50% of our cases involve property management that we receive. So it's interesting, however, because the property management cases include everything, um, we actually have seen almost no property management cases during COVID. So it's odd because even though the moratorium existed, it's not as if our complaints were related to evictions. Our complaints, as you're going to see, relate to everything. But the sales complaints exploded over the COVID period, obviously with all the sales transactions that were happening. But you wouldn't have expected the property management ones to drop off, but that's exactly what did happen. So that, that's, I thought, was interesting. So, okay, sorry about that. So background checks. Um, that's where we see the first of our complaint areas. So landlords complain that the brokers aren't performing enough of a background check, and then the tenants are complaining that they've been discriminated against. So most property management agreements actually don't say what you're going to do in the relation to background checks. So if you're doing a background check, manage expectations and let your owners know what you're going to do. I had a case where it was a property manager who drafted their own property management agreement, which you can do because you're a party to the contract. Um, not a good idea, but they did it. They, in their property management agreement, said that they were going to do extensive background checks, including credit, references, criminal checks. And when I actually came into the office and took a look at a random sampling of files, what I saw were credit karma, credit reports in the files. And she was charging every applicant $65. Now you're allowed, allowed to charge an applicant for doing a background check. But generally what we see is you've hired a credit reporting agency, for instance, and you're paying them X amount. And then you're allowed to charge on top of that for your time. She wasn't doing any of that. She was just blanket charging $65 and not doing anything. So that, that was a problem for us. So for tenants, they're saying that they've been discriminated against. So discrimination is permitted when it's related to their ability to pay, credit history, or prior rental history, but not when it's based on the protected classes. And I think everybody knows that but we've actually had cases where brokers were caught discriminating in leasing their own properties. And they were disciplined not just by us, but were actually fined by the Human Relations Commission. So be aware of that, that the Human Relations Commission is North Carolina's um, version of um, fair housing, that both can happen. So investigate all applicants the same. When it comes to criminal record checks, you can do those, but be aware that HUD and FHA are looking at disparate impacts now. And I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly because there is a detailed section on this in the update course this year. So um, related to this, I wanna, I actually have to read this to you because I don't have this memorized. Um, the HUD guidelines say that across the United States, African Americans and Hispanics are arrested, convicted, and incarcerated at rates disproportionate to their share of the general population. Consequentially, criminal records-based barriers to housing are likely to have a disproportionate impact on minority home seekers. So for that reason, you need to be aware that you can't have a blanket policy related to this saying, that if you have a felony on your record, we're not gonna rent to you. So you have to consider how much time has passed and um, what they were convicted for, things like that. Take those things into consideration. 
So how many brokers and charges do I have in here? Can I get a show of hands? Okay. So this is related to brokers and charges because they're the ones that handle the depositing of security deposits. So what I wanna make you aware of is that the reason it is so necessary for trust or escrow to be on your bank account is because it gives the account special status. If you don't have those words on your account, guess what? The FDIC is not even going to insure the money in it. Trust or escrow tells the world that that is not your money. So that is why it is so critical that it's on the account, checks and deposit slips. That's what's in the rule. And if it's not on there, if you die, if you become involved in a civil suit, IRS tax lien, those monies can be attached by the courts, by the IRS. And again, FDIC is not actually going to insure or cover those monies um, for your clients up to each individual client's money being 250,000. So let me get back up again. For the account itself, it will be covered up to $250,000. But if it's a trust or escrow account, each individual client's money is insured up to the $250,000 amount. So I wanna back up and correct myself there. The only other thing is that brokers can't get a bond um, in lieu of a security deposit. You only landlords are allowed to do that under the law. So notice of deposit. So how many people here are actually using the North Carolina Association of Realtor forms um, for their lease? Can I just have you shout out? Or do you have an attorney draft um, the contract? We have a turn draft the contract. Okay. All right. So having said that, the North Carolina Association of Realtor Form has where the account is in it already. If you have an attorney drafted contract, you need to make sure that the attorney puts it in there. The reason that this is important is if you don't tell the tenant where their money is and you have 30 days to do so from the time that you've taken their security deposit, then you're potentially forfeiting your owner's right to any of it. So even one of our attorneys here had a case when he was in private practice he went to an eviction for non-payment of rent representing his landlord client. And because the landlord client had not told the tenant where their money was, it didn't matter that there were past due rents. It didn't matter that there were damages to the property. That $1,500 that they paid in security deposit was had to be paid back to the tenant. And the landlord didn't get to keep it. So if you don't tell the tenant where their money is within 30 days, you forfeit your landlord's right to keep any of it, even if there are damages. So that's, that's a big one. Make sure that you're aware of that. So disclosure of material facts. I work for the Real Estate Commission and I'm even guilty of this. When I think of material facts, I think of sales transactions. Like that is at the absolute front of my mind. I don't think about the fact that it applies to all brokerage, commercial, property management, and even vacation rental. So I had a case where you had this beautiful house here. And before it rained, it was gorgeous. But after it rained, you needed goulashes to, on your feet, rubber boots to get out of the car, to get into the house. And this was not disclosed to the tenant prior to them entering into a lease agreement. The property manager knew that the property got flooded in this manner prior to renting it to the tenant because 
they even told the owner, they had people come out and give estimates on how to fix it. Well, they were going to be required, the owner that is, to put a French string in from the top of the driveway all the way down. And the owner didn't want to spend that money. Now, when I tell you, I don't have a better picture to show you. There were multiple pictures sent to me. The property manager tried to say that this type of flooding only happened during hurricanes. This tenant sent me pictures every single time there was just a standard heavy rain. The washer and dryer in the garage were on cinder blocks. So that was what clued me into the fact that the property manager knew in advance. Those wouldn't have been on cinder blocks, except for the fact that this garage flooded and the whole property flooded. Needless to say, the tenant had to be released. They had to be given all their money back um, and they had to disclose this in the future. So pet deposits. So we actually don't get complaints about pet deposits that often, hardly at all, but I get asked about it all the time. So this seems to be an area of interest of property managers. So the standard is that it's a non-refundable pet deposit. And in those instances, you can go ahead and give the money to the landlord. If it's non-refundable, it needs to be kept in the trust account. Or if it's refundable, it needs to be in the trust account. Sorry about that. Um, this is a fee for the privilege of having a pet. It is not, you can use it for damages, but you can also use a security deposit for damages. So I wanna make that clear. This is not part of the security deposit. This is a fee for the privilege of having a pet. It's not a true deposit. You can use this and the security deposit for any pet damages. The exception of course is service animals. And that was covered, I believe last year or the year before in the update course. So I'm not going to go into that too much. And do I have any questions out there from anybody so far? All right, so issues during the tenancy, late fees. You're allowed to charge late fees. You're allowed to take it out of the security deposit at the end of the tenancy. What we would not wanna see is for there to actually have been a lot of damages to the actual property and Instead of using the security deposit to pay your owner for the damages, you have a property management agreement that says that you get the late fees and instead you pay yourself first. So we've seen that. That doesn't, that, that doesn't go over well with landlords and it, and it doesn't go over well with the real estate commission. So we would expect that if you're getting the late fees, which is perfectly fine, that's something you negotiate in your property management agreement, but that you're not going to actually be paying yourself in front of the, the landlord if there are actual damages. And then I wanna make sure that um, it's understood that if you have section eight housing, that it's only the amount that the tenant pays that you can charge the, um, the late fee against. So if the tenant's only paying $20, then the $15 might be the higher amount of the late fee. So just be aware of that. So um, this has been updated. I've also seen that in our legislature, they're actually continuing to tweak it. For some reason, they're changing complaint filing fee to an administrative complaint filing fee. And it became effective June 23rd, 2021. And the most interesting thing that I saw is that it says reasonable fees actually paid or owed. Paid or owed is what has changed in this language. It used to say actually in heard previously. So I don't know, you as property managers probably know what happened to cause them to change this. 
but it used to say actually incurred. Now it says paid or owed. And it's, like I said, it's in front of the legislature again, so it's probably gonna be changing again here shortly. So just be aware of that as well. Okay, NSF fees. When um, we come in to do an audit, a field investigator, or we're looking at asking you to send us in files, we're gonna look at the entire property management agreement. We're gonna look at the entire lease agreement. And what we see frequently is even though the language literally says maximum processing fee by state law is, we see people putting in $65, $75. They're just making up an amount and putting it in the return check fee blank. I can't tell you how often we see that. So if we see that, then we're going to actually look to see if you've been charging people the extra fee. Um, I have not seen people actually charging the tenants that higher fee. So um, full disclosure, I haven't seen anybody actually charge it but I've seen it in the, in the documents. So landlords entering the premises. I had a very interesting case where it was a horrible misunderstanding and the tenants um, in this case filed the complaint. They actually took a recording of the entire encounter. The property manager was told that there was a pet on the property. They contacted the tenant and said, hey, I understand you have a pet on the property and I need to come over and verify that you don't because your lease doesn't allow you to have a pet. And the tenant said, sure, come over. We don't have a pet on the property. Take a look at the property. Well, the landlord, when they came, actually decided to kill two birds with one stone and do their inspection at the same time. So they came with the camera and wanting to do the full inspection and take pictures of the property at the same time. Well, the tenant then wouldn't allow the uh, property manager to enter the property at that point. So what was going on in the background is that the tenant believing that the property manager was just coming over to verify that there wasn't a pet didn't clean up. They were actually in a custody battle. And that's why they didn't want the pictures taken because they knew that their spouse was potentially savvy enough to um, subpoena the property manager's records, inspection records. And so they didn't want pictures taken. This escalated to the point of the police being called. And what ended up happening was the property manager was allowed to go into the property and do the inspection, but not take pictures. So I just bring this example in to say, please consider what might be going on in the background of a tenant. Um, you might not, I mean, the tenant didn't tell this to the property manager. The property manager had would no way of knowing. It's me being in the middle, getting both sides of the story where I'm getting the whole story. And in this instance, the tenant was right to not want their property taken, having the pictures taken of. And the property manager made a point of saying, you wouldn't believe how messy that house was. Well, they had five kids, including a newborn. So that's not surprising. So just, just be aware that there could be things going on that you're not aware of. So this is what our landlords complain about. We get this complaint all the time. Your property management agreements typically don't say we're going to disperse after checks have cleared. I don't know if any of you still accept checks. Um, but if you do, you know, you have to still wait for time for checks to clear. They're clearing faster, but you still have to wait. None of that information is in most property management agreements I've read. I can count on one hand, the number of property management agreements that I have read that 
had any language in it to the landlord managing expectations by saying, hey, Mr. Landlord, yes, the tenant is late on day six. That doesn't mean you're getting paid on day seven. You're probably not going to get paid till day 20. And the reason is, I mean, you don't have to say all that, but manage expectations with your landlords that they, in fact, are not going to be paid on the sixth or seventh from those tenants. So that's just a best practice um, because we really do get the landlords complaining about this all the time. So upkeep, this is another big one from landlords. If you have a maintenance firm, if you are charging um, to be a facilitator of maintenance issues, that is perfectly fine. But you have to disclose it to your owners in advance of them entering into an agreement with you. They have a right to know exactly all the expenses that they can expect to pay when they hire you. The complaint we get is that they're being upcharged for maintenance and they had no idea and they didn't agree to it. If we come in, I'm thrilled that the Association of Realtor Form actually has put this in there now that if you're going to do an upcharge, that's in the standard form now. And I'm thrilled about that because um, it's much easier to see. But if you have a maintenance company or you're using subcontractors, just know that if I come into audit and you're charging a 15% upcharge for facilitating the maintenance, I'm gonna ask to see the invoices that you send to your client but then I'm going to ask to see the original invoice as well, because what I'm looking for is that the upcharge is exactly what it says in the property management agreement. So you might have a maintenance company that is completely separate and it's not brokerage, but I'm still going to look at those files for this reason. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. All right, so the landlords complain of also about the lack of inspections. Um, and I am finding more and more that property managers, when I ask about if they're doing inspections, the answer that I get is no, we're doing drive-bys. When the, um, lease is up for renewal, then we actually go in and do an inspection. But otherwise, all we're doing is driving by. I can tell you that I had a neighbor who had a beautiful yard. And oh, I have to apologize. We have the automatic lights and they go out if I don't move. Sorry about that. Um, I had a neighbor who had a beautiful yard. She loved gardening but she wouldn't let me in her house for anything because she said she spent all her time outside gardening. She wasn't doing house maintenance or upkeep. I've had cases where there has been $7,500 worth of damage when the outside looked beautiful. They were maintaining the outside, but you don't, the outside is not an indication of what's going on inside. So periodically check best practices. It's not one of our rules. It's an expectation of best practices as a property manager that this is going to happen. I had a, this is an extreme case, and I, and I admit that, but a case out in the mountains where there was a tenant who had mental issues and was required to take medication and go to counseling. And this particular property manager actually did quarterly inspections on this property. And Immediately after one of her quarterly inspections, the tenant went off their medications. And before they even got back in three months to do the next inspection, the property, which is small, had over $11,000 in damages. And they couldn't enter it without wearing hazmat suits. So 
this tenant stopped taking the trash out. All the trash was built up in this small house. They started catching feral cats and keeping them in the house and had maybe one kitty litter box, but then the feral cats were trying to get out, obviously, doing a lot of damage, not using the kitty litter box. She had open cans of food all over the house. They needed a hazmat suit to actually enter this property three months later. That's how much damage that was done in that short amount of time. And they had to tear it down to studs. It was that bad. So just be aware, do the inspections um, and don't do drive-bys because it's not good enough. All right, so time to go, security deposits. So these are the things that you were allowed to keep the security deposit for, non-payment of rent, physical damages, non-fulfillment of the rental period, uh, tenants unpaid bills that become a lien on the property. The only county that I'm aware of that does that is actually um, New Hanover County. So cost of re-renting after a breach, court costs after a successful ejectment, cost of removal and storage, and any authorized fees. So that's the law change that we saw before. I'm not going to go into the section in detail. We actually have a 45-minute presentation that's on nothing but tenant security deposits. So I'm just going to go through the couple of things that we see most frequently. So security deposits for damages. Oh, I thought I had one more um, notice on there. So when you have in the lease agreement, and we see this all the time, you have to have the carpets professionally shampooed when you leave. You have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do the other thing. If a tenant doesn't do those things, unless, I'm gonna use the carpet as an example, unless there's an actual stain on the carpet, that's not damages. Them not having the carpet professionally shampooed is not a damage for which you can use a security deposit. That is a breach of contract for which you have to go after the tenants um, for monetary damages. So the other thing is cleaning fees. We see people charging blanket cleaning fees. The cleaning has to rise to the level of damage. So it has to be so filthy as to constitute the damage. Now, if you have a tenant in a property for three years, and they've never once cleaned the oven, then that probably, and they use the oven a lot, then that might rise to the level of a damage, such filth that it requires you to use the security deposit. But you don't get to charge the whole cleaning. You only get to charge against the deposit for what it took to clean the oven. Does that, does that make sense? It does, but I'm sure that I'm not the only one who struggles, especially with cleaning issues, struggles to know where it tips over. Right. Yep, that, that's understandable. I will tell you that if I'm coming in, I'm going to look at past security deposit accountings, and I actually don't see... If we see blanket every single security deposit is being charged a cleaning fee, and by the way, we don't generally, um, then that's going to be problematic for us and it'll be noted. But I actually do see property managers being fairly good about this in charging a portion. So if I'm seeing a cleaning fee, then I'm also going to ask you for pictures and I'm going to actually... Um, ask you for the cleaning invoice to see what was charged and what was used from that cleaning invoice. But I just, I just wanna make it clear that things like the cleaning, it has to be so filthy that it constitutes the damage. And that is a judgment call. It's just like material fact, it's a judgment call. So um, we trust you to make them. And I just, this is, this is a hot button issue um, for a lot of brokers, and I understand that. 
So anybody else have any input or comments or questions related to this? I know that there are generally a lot of questions. It's why we have a 45 minute presentation on security deposits. So, all right, accounting. Um, this is a, a situation where you're required to account within 30 days the landlord's willful failure to account. And that's literally the way it is in the law, the landlord's willful failure, but input property manager there, right? Because you're acting on behalf of the landlord to account to a tenant is also gonna forfeit a landlord's right to any of the money. So I had a case, that, and this is not, uncommon where we have just a small little complaint that says I didn't get my security deposit accounting in time and it blows up into a large case. This particular case had so many other things wrong. I will tell you that we had a hearing and this particular licensee was permanently revoked. It literally started out from a tenant saying they didn't give me my accounting within 30 days. So the consumer protection officer asked for the accounting and the property manager sent an accounting that looked squirrely. So they followed up and said, this doesn't look correct. Can you explain this, this, and this? And then the property manager stopped responding. So then it gets sent to me because as a field investigator, if licensees stop responding to our consumer protection officers. I don't know if they think that we're going to go away, but trust me, we don't ever go away. I mean, we really aren't scary, but we're not ever going to drop a, a, a case or an investigation. So we're always going to show up and it just escalates it. So um, then I became involved. I looked and sure enough, the, the document had been forged. But then we get another complaint from actually a family member that has nothing to do with brokerage. It had to do with a, one of the family members dying, and this was related to the broker's husband. So this was a family fight with the husband, but they provided documentation. Because we already had a complaint open, they just added it, that showed that money from the security deposit had been used to pay for the painting of the deceased family member's property that came out of the tenant security deposit account. So it just escalated. It wasn't just this one thing. Um, I was shocked and stunned that this particular licensee, knowing that they had were doing so many things wrong, didn't just pay this money to this tenant to make the tenant go away. So, but they didn't and they now don't have a license. So if you can't account within 30 days, you know you have to account within 60 days. And this is the language that I mentioned before, the willful failure to provide it forfeits the owner's right to any of it. So just be aware of it, make sure you make those deadlines so that you don't have a tenant suing for the not getting an accounting, all right? Okay, so no such thing as a disputed tenant security deposit. The disputed rule can only, only applies to earnest money deposits. So we generally say, follow your landlord's lawful instructions. If you have a landlord, for instance, that is telling you to charge every single tenant a cleaning fee, whether or not it rises to the level of damage or not, that's an unlawful direction by your owner. We actually would expect that you would not continue to manage for that owner. Because if they give you an unlawful direction one time, the likelihood is that they're going to continue to do so. And then you already know up front that that's likely the case. So we would expect that you would no longer manage for that property, just um, let you know. If that happens, let the tenant know that you no longer manage. 
we would expect that you would also tell the landlord what you believe is the lawful amount to take from the security deposit. And the disputed rule doesn't apply as I stated. So useful resources. I like to provide these to you because the, obviously the landlord tenant law is on the General Assembly's website, that's ncleg.gov. That's your Bible. We would expect you to know that backwards and forwards, General Statute 42. The Attorney General's website is a great place to get information on what the Attorney General is saying the tenant's rights are. So when it comes to the statute, we actually have to follow the Attorney General's direction. So if they say something's against public policy, then that's the way we enforce it. Does that make sense? So we're kind of an extension of them when it comes to that. So this tells you what the attorney general is telling tenants their rights are. And then we have a ton of publications regarding tenant security deposits, renting, things like that. We're also giving the consumer information on their rights. And that's another good resource for you to use to know what we are saying is the tenant's rights. And then of course we have best practices for property managers. Stephen Fussell wrote that article. We have a lot of resources for you to use on our website. I would really encourage you to go to our website if you haven't been there and take a look at the videos. We have a lot of trust accounting videos for you brokers in charges out there, brokers in charge. Um, and we have a lot of articles that cover property management over the years. So that is it for me. Does anybody have any follow-up questions or concerns about what you heard today that I can help answer? Gina, I'm watching the chat and it is quiet. Okay. Um, will you share the slides please via email? That's on me, Michelle, I'll take care of that. Jean was uh, gracious enough to send me her slide deck this morning and I will, I'll just pop that up on the um, Google. And you know group. what, I'm actually gonna put in chat my email address. If anybody ever has any questions feel free to email me. I am absolutely happy to answer any questions you have. Actually, I do have a question. Um, unlicensed, right, unlicensed property managers, we occasionally come across people acting as property managers by the definition and the real estate commission done. When we filed complaints, they just say, nope, sorry, not a licensee. What's going on there? I mean, is it just because they're not a licensee and we're not gonna, you don't enforce the rules or? No, I'm, that's, that's a little um, perplexing because we in fact do investigate unlicensed property managers. The, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to phrase this. Um, I guess about five, six years ago, there were owners that went to the legislature and had the exemptions extended. So there are exemptions for people who own properties through an LLC, but then create a property management LLC to manage properties owned by another LLC. Yeah, we the situation to... I'm thinking of was not okay. that at all. So... It was... Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Greg. So no. yeah, so that was one situation. Then we actually had another one where a client came to us. He had had um, his security deposits, everything held with a licensee. She refused to release the money to him when he moved the contract over. And then because July 1 occurred, she was no longer an active licensee and the real estate commission refused to take any action against her as well, even though this happened while she was a licensee. Now this was years ago. So, I mean, I, okay. I haven't seen any new examples recently, but I was always perplexed me. It's like the state bar will go after you because we're members member of the state bar as well. Right. They'll definitely go after unauthorized practice of law. So I didn't know 
that was the situation or is that an old thing and I, times have changed? I think that's changed because I've worked here for 16 years, like I said, and I've been investigating for 12 of them. Okay. And I have investigated a lot of unlicensed brokerage um, complaints. And, and I do know that we pursue them. Oh, excellent. That's what I wanted to hear. Because <laughs> at the time, okay. it was very, it was like, what? why? <laughs> you yeah, go no, after us I, for I the mean, littlest thing, and <laughs> you won't yeah. go after an unlicensed person. <laughs> yeah, the exemption so really has been widened, like I said. So things that we actually would have gone after before, the LLC property management company managing for properties owned by a separate LLC, that's the loosely held business that is now written into the law. Um, so that instance, they're allowed to do that now, unfortunately. But we will look at that. If you file the complaint, we'll determine whether or not they're exempt or if they're actually engaged in the unlicensed practice of brokerage, and we will investigate and pursue those cases. Okay, thank you. They don't end up in the back of the bulletin, however, because they actually are handled through um, the court system. Right. I figured it would be referral to a prosecutor. That's how it would work. So. Okay. Thank you for Jean, that, Greg. Yes. Jean, we have a question in the... Uh, um, chat asking whether your slides can be shared on social media. So I, I see that. Can I get back to you? I actually need to run that by um, my division director to see if they're okay with that. So can, okay, I will get, I will get back to you. Todd, should I get back to you on that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I will get an answer to that by the end of the day and get that back to you. Okay. I can right. tell you're reading the chat yourself now. Jean, I am so now. I yes, I opened it. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, um, comments, input? All right. I'll speak for the group. I really appreciated that presentation. I did not know that representatives of the commission did things like this. So oh. I am delighted to have made this contact. And you do seem far less... Uh, frightening to me now <laughs> than you did an hour ago. That At least there's that. Um, Good. I'm glad. And if there, thank you so much, Jean. You can sign off if you'd like okay. with our deepest gratitude. All right. Thank you all so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you.